Hello and welcome again one and all to the third lesson on vectors. So today what are we going to be doing? So the main thing we're going to do today is we're going to look at how vectors can be represented in different forms again, namely the i and j form and column vector form, which we've done before, but this time we're also going to see how we can work out the vector forms from applying simple Pythagoras and trigonometry to particular vector type questions. So it'll make more sense when we come to it. First of all, let's have a look at the warm-up questions. Questions one, two, three, and four. Here they are as ever. So what I'd like you to do is try these warm-up questions on your own independently of these video solutions. When you're ready to see the answers, press play and then compare your solutions against mine and just make sure that you're agreeing with me and that you've not made any little slips. So let's get straight to it and have a look at question one. Question one, we have a diagram showing two similar right angled triangles, A, B, C, and D, E, F. So we need to calculate the scale factor, S, giving the answer in exact form. So what we've given here, as we move from A, B, C to D, E, F, we're given the size of the hypotenuse on the transformed triangle. We could do, therefore, working out the original size of the hypotenuse on ABC. So if you see here, we can do this by applying Pythagoras. So the length of side BC will be the square root of the square of the other sides added together. So AB squared is 2 squared. AC squared is 1 squared. So side BC equals the square root of 5. So what's happened here is this triangle, the side BC, has been shrunk from root 5 to 1. And so we need to find out what multiplicative factor would take something from being a size of root 5 to 1. So in other words, root 5 has been multiplied by S and has ended up becoming 1. So with a simple rearrangement, we can say that s must be 1 divided by root 5. And then if we rationalise the denominator by multiplying both top and bottom by root 5, we'll see that this one here ends up being root 5 over 5. So therefore S is just this scale factor. Question two, calculate theta. Give your answer to one decimal place. This really couldn't be much simpler. This is GCSE trig in its simplest form. So we know the opposite side is two. We know the adjacent is one. This is gonna be applied by the way later on when we can work out the angle in between a vector and the X or Y axes. So more on that later. For now, we know that tan theta is the opposite over the adjacent. So that's going to be 2 over 1, which is obviously just 2. So therefore, theta is going to be tan minus 1 of 2 over 1, which is just 2, of course. So if we bust out our class-wise calculators and do shift tan, so shift tan to get inverse tan, then press 2, we see but the size of this angle to one decimal place, of course, is 63.4 degrees. Question three, a bit of revision on some statistics. So we have two block box plots to be comparing. So the box plots show the distribution of speeds of cars on two different motorways. So we need to make two comparisons of the speeds on the two motorways. So what we need to do here, when we're comparing box plots, we need to make two comparisons. We need to compare medians. So always, if it's a box plot, compare medians. And then compare now we've got two options here. Compare either 
the range or this is second comparison so compare the range or the interquartile range now I personally believe and most people in general in fact would believe that the interquartile range is a more meaningful comparison to make so what I'd suggest doing would be to compare the medians and to compare the interquartile ranges so then we need to also compare them in context so you can't just compare median and say median for A is higher than median B what I'd say is just add a bit of context to it so for example what I'd say is something like this the cars tended to be faster on motorway A than motorway B so that's because the median of A is greater than the median of B in other words 76 miles an hour which is the median of A is higher than the median of B which is 72 miles per hour so the median is a measure of central tendency which in general terms is a measure of like a typical value so the typical value for A is higher than the typical value for B in very broad terms the second comparison I've gone for is the interquartile range so I'd say something along the lines of the speeds of the cars is more varied on motorway B than motorway A interquartile range is a measure of spread the bigger in the interquartile range is the bigger the spread so because the interquartile range is bigger for B than for A we therefore say that the speeds of cars is more varied or, or more spread out on motorway B than motorway A for comparison the interquartile range of B is 10 miles per hour the interquartile range of A is 5 miles per hour it's just the length of this box so the length here is 5 for A and for B the length of this box is 10 finally for the warm-up we've got question 4 it says the coordinates of two points A and B are 1 minus 7 and minus 1 3 respectively find the gradient of a line perpendicular to the line segment AB so first of all what I'd suggest we might want to do is to work out the gradient of AB now the gradient of any line segment is the change in y between the two points on that line segment divided by the change in x between those two points on the same line segment so here if you have a look at what a is the y coordinate at a is minus 7 but we subtract that from the y coordinate of b which is 3 and the change in x the x coordinate at b is 1 then we subtract away the x coordinate at a so the x coordinate at uh, b which is minus 1 so 1 minus minus 1 so all we're doing here is just comparing a to b whoops it's a slightly too big stylus so you can do a minus b on top a minus b on the bottom or b minus a then b minus a as long as you're consistent you'll arrive at the same answer so here what i've done is i've taken a and subtracted from that b for the x and y coordinates respectively so when we do that we get minus 7 minus 3 on top which is minus 10 1 minus minus 1 is 2 so either way around you should have got that the gradient of AB is minus 5 now we want the gradient of a line perpendicular to the line segment AB so you need to remember that perpendicular lines have a gradient which is the negative reciprocal of the line they're perpendicular to so we say that the gradient of a line perpendicular to AB equals minus 1 over minus 5 the minuses cancel so that gives us a gradient of 1 fifth and that's all we need to do for the warm-up so now we can move on to the main bit of the lesson so 
like I said, we're going to be talking about Pythagoras' theorem today in terms of working out properties of vectors, in particular the magnitude of a vector. So we're going to have a look here, first of all, at this half of the question. So consider the specific vector a, which is 3i plus 4j. So a, b and c, we're going to calculate the magnitude of a. I'll talk you through what the magnitude means, don't worry. A unit vector in the direction of a. I'll explain what that means too. And finally, part C, we need to find the angle between A and the positive x-axis. So what we could do first of all is to draw a triangle that represents vector A in relation to its i and j components. So here's a triangle I drew earlier. So we're told that A, which I'll just pop in here, is the sum of going three in the x direction. In other words, this is three i, and going four in the y direction. So that's four j. So part a, calculate the magnitude of a. So what do we mean by the magnitude of a vector? Okay. Okay, the magnitude of a vector, just essentially in plain English means the size of the line that represents it. Okay, so in this case, A is the hypotenuse, which is longer than 3 and 4. And because I is perpendicular to vector J, we know this is a right angled triangle. So for A, we say that the magnitude of A We write this as the modulus of A, so two vertical lines with a vector inside. This is how you represent the magnitude of a vector. So generally, the magnitude of a vector is going to be the square root of its x, sorry, of its i components squared. So the i component here is 3. It's going to be 3 squared plus the square of its j component. So the j component here is 4, so we do 4 squared. So we get 3 from here, and we get this 4 from the j component. So square root of 3 squared plus 4 squared is 25. So therefore, the magnitude of A is simply 5. Now part b, a unit vector means we want a vector which has magnitude exactly 1. We want it to be in the direction of a, okay? So we want a unit vector parallel to a that has magnitude of 1. So what we need to do here, I'll explain the quick way of doing it later. We want to take a and multiply it by a scalar so that the magnitude of it becomes 1. So currently, the magnitude of this is 5. So what could we multiply a by? What constant term could we multiply a by to shrink down its magnitude from 5 down to 1? Hopefully, you'll be thinking, well, can't we just divide it by 5? Yes, we can. So another way of thinking of dividing by 5 is we multiply by 1 fifth. Generally speaking, what we do, a unit vector in the direction of a vector you have is the vector you want divided by its own magnitude. So we take A and divide it by its own magnitude. So dividing by 5 means we've got one fifth of A, where A is obviously, whoops, a is 3i plus 4j. Finally, part c, finding the angle between a and the positive x-axis. Well, a is going up, as you can see. The positive x-axis is another way of saying the angle it makes with the i vector, any vector going in the i direction. So we want this angle here. Let's call that theta. So for part C, 
to find theta, we can do tan theta. So tan theta is the opposite, which is 4, divided by the adjacent, which is 3. So therefore, if we do inverse tan, theta is going to be tan minus 1 of 4 over 3. So if we use our class whiz for this, so tan minus 1, 4 over 3, to one decimal place, we get 53.1 degrees. So that's how we work out the magnitude, a unit vector, and the angle between a vector and the positive x-axis for this particular vector A. What I want to consider now is the general case, how we can apply these ideas generally by considering the general vector B, where B is x lots of i plus y lots of j. So in the similar way, let's just get the triangle ready, which we can annotate on. So in general terms, if I label B as the resultant of x lots of i and y lots of j, we have this. So same questions, just applied generally. How do we find the magnitude generally of a vector B? Well, the magnitude of B, just applying what we did from this part on the left, the magnitude of B is just the square root of the squares of its i and j components added together. So to work out the magnitude of any vector, you square its i component and add to that the square of its j component and then square root. So that is well worth remembering. So that is the general way to find the magnitude of any vector. Part B, to find the unit vector in the direction of B, because B is a general vector, this will work for any vector at all. To find a unit vector, once you know a general vector, you take the vector you want to make into a unit vector, in this case B, and you divide it by its own magnitude. So in general, this is going to be 1 over the magnitude of b, which was the square root of x squared plus y squared, and all that multiplied by the vector b itself. So multiply that by xi plus yj. And then part c, in general terms, how do we find the angle between a general vector b and the positive x-axis? This angle here. Linking it back to the specific case over here, we just do tan minus 1 of its y component over its x component. So these general results are worth trying to remember. If you can't remember them, then I suggest we apply them time and time again until they become second nature. But these are important results which we're going to see and use later on, in particular now in some of these worked examples. So worked example one. We're told that A is 15i plus 8j and B is minus 3i minus another j. So first of all, part A, we need to find A. So for this one, A, the magnitude of A is simply the square root of its i component squared added to its j component squared. So 15 squared plus 8 squared, all square rooted. So again, if you use a class whiz for this, type the square root symbol. 15 squared plus 8 squared gives us 17. Part B. Find the unit vector in the direction of A. So because we want something parallel to A, which is a unit vector, we just take A, 
then divide it by its own magnitude. So we take A and divide it by 17. Divided by 17 is the same as doing 1 17th of something. So we just do 1 17th of the vector A, which is 15i plus 8j. And finally, last but not least, we want to find the exact value of the resultant of 2a plus b, the magnitude of this resultant. So what we need to do first is the resultant and then do the magnitude of that. So we need to work out what 2a plus b actually is. So 2a plus b equals two lots of 15i plus 8j in column vector form. And then for b, we add on minus 3i and minus 1j. So 2, I've had to do this on another line, so it's not quite as, as messy. So 2 times 15 is 30. 2 times 8 is 16. So we add to that minus 3 and minus 1. So then we get 27 and 15. So that is what 2a plus b is. 2a plus b is 27i plus 15j. So therefore, in the final step, the magnitude of 2a plus b is going to be the square root of 27 squared plus 15 squared. We want this in exact form, so we'll leave it in third form and use your calculator to help. In fact, just do it on your calculator. Why not just play it safe? So we have the square root of 27 squared plus 15 squared and we get three lots of root 106. And finally, that's the first worked example completed. Worked example two, find the angle between the vector 5i plus 2j and the positive x-axis. So in plain English, this just means the vector has a direction where it's going five to the right and two up. So it's going in sort of this direction here. Okay, so what we need to think about is how far along it's going in terms of this triangle and how far up. And like I've just said, to be honest, uh, it means it's going five along. So this line here is gonna be five and it's gonna go two up. And we get the five and the two from the fact that it's five i and two j. Um, this is the x-axis going along and this is the vector 5i plus 2j. So the angle we're needing to find is this angle here. So hopefully you can see that it's going to be the tan function. So tan theta is going to be the opposite which is 2 divided by the adjacent which is 5. So therefore theta will be tan minus 1 of 2 over 5, which with a little bit of help from the class whiz, you'll see is shift tan 2 divided by 5. You should be getting 21.8 degrees to 3 sig figs. Last work example, question three. We're told that vector A, vector A has a magnitude six and makes an angle of 30 degrees with J. And we need to find A in both I, J format and in column vector format. So what we're gonna do here is we're gonna take this part of the diagram and 
think about it on an XY coordinate grid, but differently labeled. So if this is 30, I want to consider now the angle between A and the horizontal. So if I just draw in the horizontal, this vertical, and then A, which is here, we can actually fairly easily work out this and this. So if this angle's 30, it stands to reason that this angle here must be the extra 60 that make the right angle. So we can label on that this is 60 degrees. We're also told that A has a magnitude of 6. So the magnitude of a vector on a diagram represents the length of the line which is representing the vector itself. So magnitude of 6 means A would be represented by a line of length 6. So in other words, this line here, the hypotenuse, will have a length of 6. So the length of this hypotenuse all the way along is 6. So to find A in I and J format, we need to find the x component of this line, call this x, and the y component of the line. So we can use simple trig to work out y and x. Because this involves the hypotenuse, it's going to be the sine and the cosine function. So if we want to work out x, x is the adjacent side, and 6 is the hypotenuse. So the cosine of 60 is the adjacent, which is x, divided by the hypotenuse, which is 6. If we rearrange this, we see that therefore x must be 6 lots of cos 60. So if you can't remember your exact trig ratios, just use your calculator to back you up. 6 cos 60 equals exactly 3. And so we can say that x is actually free. And similarly for y, to work out y, which is the opposite, we can use the sine function. So sine 60 is the side opposite to 60, which is y itself, divided by the hypotenuse, which is still 6. So therefore y equals 6 lots of sine 60. So again, use your calculator. Sine 60, 6 lots of sine 60, gives us 3 lots of root 3. So we can add this onto the diagram as well, that sine of um, 6 sine 60, sorry, y, is 3 root 3. There we go. So therefore, we've got all we need to work out what A is. So in I and J form, we can say that A equals three lots of I, because we're going three to the right, plus, because Y is three root three, we're going three lots of root three up. So three root three lots of j. In column vector form, we can say that a equals three, because we're going three to the right. On the bottom, three root three, because we're going 3 root 3 up. Now, because this is a common factor of 3, we could also say it's equal to 3 lots of 1 root 3. That's optional. This will do. That's a valid alternative. So that's how we do work to example 3. So a few basic examples there. Keep it short and sweet, ready to free you up to have a go at some of these yourselves. So, 
here are the suggested exercises. If you turn to page 241, exercise 11C, and try the suggested questions. You should know the rule by now. Try all the questions yourselves. Self-assess where possible. If you make a mistake, try first and foremost to see where you've gone wrong yourself. To spot your own mistakes is much more powerful than me telling you where you've gone wrong. If you're really at a loose end, ask me as a last resort and I'll try and point you in the right direction. So keep working hard, keep plugging away. See me or email me if you're stuck, as I say. Please remember to subscribe to the channel, that would be really sweet of you. And if all else fails, keep yourself safe and I'll see you next lesson. Thanks for listening. I'll see you all soon.